the UK Parliament for 23 years, and he was a Minister for Science and Technology at the Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, at the moment, he is, he is a member of the UK Science and Technology Facilities Council and a non-executive director of or advisor to several companies, mainly in technology, environment and security sectors. Please welcome Ian Taylor. Thank you very much indeed. I'll make sure that these slides work. They do, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's strange listening to Julie Meyer because so much of what she said I entirely agree with. But I was science and technology minister in the mid-1990s when um, <coughs> things were rather different in terms of connectivity from what they are today. And I remember that I was the first ever British minister to have an email address. That was in 1994. And I had to persuade the permanent secretary that this was going to be something that they could allow. Uh, and there was a lot, big argument, you probably don't know, but every ministerial call, so if you ever phone a minister, the private secretary listens into the call. It's standard practice. There's, um, we don't advise every caller that the private secretary is listening. And the permanent secretary couldn't work out. Someone might contact me, but not go through the private secretary. And then he suddenly said, oh, of course, it doesn't matter. Because no one else has an email address, so no one else is going to email you. And you've got to try and put yourselves back only to 1994, when there was no World Wide Web, there was nothing. And it was a long time before data became more dominant in mobile and phone technology than uh, voice. So the exponential growth that's happened, disrupted, of course, in 2000 by the dot-com bust, but the exponential growth, the, the Moore's Law, the doubling of uh, power every 18 months, I think it was, but whatever the technical definition of Moore's Law is, uh, but, but that has just transformed the way that we work, think, and therefore the way that people react. And one point I, I'd make about what Julie was saying, which I think is critical, is she talked about David and Goliath. But what is now happening is that many of the successful Goliaths are, in fact, in open innovation concepts. They're, they're no longer afraid of David. They actually need David to help them move forward. And the company I'm about to tell you about, which I chair, uh, is a classic case of that. All our partners are pretty well the Goliaths of the age. We're the Minnow, we're the David, we're an early stage company. So that excitement, that change, that dynamism. And what I was looking for when I left Parliament was the uh, ability to be involved in dramatic change. And the thing that I looked for was something where there was a sufficient emerging trend in the marketplace that would itself act as a catalyst for innovation. So that you didn't have to create a niche and persuade everybody that it was exciting, but something that was happening anyway, and where was the innovative opportunity to interact with that? And uh, urban development, <coughs> changing urban development, was a, a, an obvious example of how that would come. Now, what's that? It's not the car you came in this morning. Shout out if you obviously know, yeah? What's going on there? Well, those two slides are indicative of what I'm coming on to talk about. What you, of course, saw was the McLaren Formula One car. And what the second slide was, was miles away from where the race is going on, people actually looking at data in real time. And that connected car has 125 sensors sending seven, you can read all the figures, I'm not going to go through them. In other words, it's a mobile data unit. There is virtually no aspect of that car, or incidentally the driver, that doesn't have a sensor attached to them that's being interrogated constantly. The implications of that, and you can see how important it is in any particular race, is that we are dealing with the ability to obtain data, analyze it in real time, and then act upon it. And those data systems of McLaren are embedded in my company, Living Planet, uh, which, uh, by the way, Julie has a very small stake in, so I'm delighted that she was uh, there today. Uh, but we've developed an urban operating system software platform which integrates this. McLaren's technology for Formula One 
is integrated into what we do, and indeed the CEO of uh, McLaren Electronics is, is on my board. Now, you might say that's rather specialist. Actually, if you look for, ironically at the Rio summit this week, for its rather strange conclusions, you'll find one particular stress about global warming and uh, uh, carbon emissions. They have concentrated a lot of transforming transport. And some of the more far-sighted people, and Bill Ford Jr. actually is one of those, is already envisaging that if we're not going to have gridlock, which they've got in Rio, the virtually impossible to move around because of too much traffic, you are going to have to have intelligent vehicles. Uh, and those intelligent vehicles don't just tell you what time of day it is or have a GPS system. Uh, they actually interact with everything in their physical environment, at the roadside and everywhere else, uh, vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to roadside communication. That is the way forward. And so that is the concept behind the urban operating system, the connected city, the ability to have applications that cross across, through sensor technology, everything within an urban environment. And that provides a huge innovative platform for you to adapt your own company or interests to how do you integrate with the urban operating system, how do you connect with people that normally your technology might not never have thought it would connect to. And there are huge opportunities, as I say, in the cities. I've given you a, a list of the sort of things that we, we can do and why it will drive it forward. Um, in a sense, everything becomes agile, intelligent, capable of being interrogated, and that can lead to huge changes. For example, I'm not going to talk about it today, but material science suddenly becomes hugely commercially profitable. And most material scientists have not seen it in that way, but you can change the fabric of a building to completely change its way it reacts to sunshine, light, water, everything else. Uh, and that can then transform the energy efficiency and the recycling of energy uh, within a building. So smart surfaces are becoming very big money spinners indeed. These sli this slide particularly focuses on the way that the world is changing uh, and, of course, the economic potential of the way the world is changing in terms of the impact on uh, per capita economic activity. There's a correlation there which is uh, very important. Uh, note the growth of the emerging markets uh, that are becoming more and more important. And in order to manage these new cities, you need efficiency and a platform that integrates. I mean, just think of all these companies that have a particular siloed solution. We can sell you this because it does that. Actually, you'll find that the new town planners, the inspired town planners around the world say, but we don't want that. We want something that that connects to. How does it connect? We are one of the providers. I'm not saying we're the only provider. Actually, competition is always about working out where someone else is wanting to be in your market. If there's no one else in your market, you've got a problem, funnily enough. Uh, just think about that. So you've got to prove your market. And so I'm prepared to accept that IBM is a small competitor of my little company. Uh, uh, but the key thing is applications need to connect to other applications. And the money, amount of money again we spent is, is enormous as we go through uh, the process. China is a, obviously a classic example. We've just signed a deal with uh, an embedded Western company, actually, but it's embedded in China and has been for a very long time. Um, I, I, funnily enough, the person who runs Smart City Investments was one of the first 35 people in Microsoft, uh, a fellow called Alan Boyd, and, and he obviously worked very closely with Bill Gates in the early stage of that. The figures here are astonishing. And let's assume that they're wrong by a big factor, but, but these figures are, are carefully researched. The, the, the way that the Chinese are going to build the cities uh, is that they are going to build them in a smart way. And so consequently, there is a huge pull through. Even on these figures, that's roughly the population of the United States today that they're going to have to rehouse in new urban environments. Um, so the pull through of technology, and if you, oh, a British company wants to be part of that, uh, my strong advice is not to go in by yourselves. China is a very dangerous place. Um, I don't mean in terms of threatening, but commercially. Uh, get sucked through to a process where we and uh, Smart City Investments will be part of the master planning for these particular cities. 
This is all part of the industrialization of the internet, and it, was, it wasn't a phrase exactly used by Julie Mayer in her opening address, but it is absolutely critical that we are now moving through to a phase where data connection, the complex machinery, uh, is the, the, if you like, the third phase of, of the way the internet has developed and the interrogation, which is sensing and analyzing control, which is actuating of devices, harvesting intelligence, that is the, the, the building block uh, of the way that uh, we are going to be using it in an urban environment. And that's machine-to-machine -machine technology. Um, the uh, applications which come through that uh, are enormous, and I've listed some of them, uh, but they go everywhere from energy through to health, education, and obviously movement of people, the ability of people to communicate with each other uh, across an urban environment. It's just going to be totally transformed from what we're used to today. So imagine my experience of being the first minister with an email address without the World Wide Web. We haven't yet seen anything today that is likely to be deployable within the next five to ten years because this is a, a sort of growth opportunity which the more people interconnect, the more things will interconnect, the more ideas will come forward to interconnect. We don't in Living Planet know quite what we will be using within the next five years, so we've got to be capable of keeping up with the uh, process. You won't follow this slide terribly carefully, uh, but I put it up because I wanted to show that Deutsche Telekom, one of our partners, uh, has got a whole series of potential applications for what it's doing, and it's only a part of what we're doing. Uh, so all of these things, we're looking at uh, a plan at the moment in Manchester for retail and commerce interactivity, uh, s smart planning uh, of that uh, outlook. I'm not going to talk about this slide for anyone who wants these slides afterwards. whole list of infrastructure requirements, which we are now talking with Hitachi Consulting about some of their projects that they're doing in, in Asia, uh, uh, helping the master plan these. One of the people on my board is the master planner for the Olympic Games in, in London, by the way. Uh, and we, uh, we have a partnership with that company, Bureau Happold. Our partners are, are varied, there's a list of them there. I mentioned McLaren, Cisco, Microsoft, uh, Philips. Philips is interesting. Philips Lighting uh, have got a new generation of street lighting. And it's going to embrace, we're doing a pilot project in Portugal, it's going to embrace our part of our urban operating system. So every time they put up a new lamppost, if you like, light, system. It's going to have an intelligence in it which will enable it to do other things through the city management, uh, smart parking, smart traffic management, uh, uh, localized information uh, is going to be built in it. So that the, the next generation of street lighting will itself be intelligent. So you're making use of something that is essential uh, for further purposes. And you also have energy management systems built into it. Um, we obviously work with uh, people like Cisco, and we're capable of working with uh, any telco-grade scalable computing hardware. Technology Strategy Board is doing some interesting things at the moment. I just mentioned one that we are the leader on, a Raptor project. It's small, but it's a, a pull-through for <coughs> learning how digital supply chains can work in a more integrated urban environment. And we've based our work in the UK in Greenwich. Uh, and so if you want to come and talk to us, we'd be very happy to do so. This slide, again, I've just put up for further reference so you can see the stages uh, of the layers, if you like, of the, the way that we build up the system. You won't read this slide at all easily, but this is a project which we've got in Portugal, which is still born at the moment. Um, one of the lessons I learn in, because uh, I've been around a long time, most of the people in Living Planet are, I wouldn't say half my age, but anyway, um, they are younger than me. Uh, but we've got a project in Portugal which we've effectively held back because of the financial crisis. We have the rights to build a new city there. But what we were going to do there, we're now deploying with others, partners uh, in various places around the world. Uh, and these are some of the partner solutions. I mentioned Philips, contract management, home lighting, uh, control center, bespoke integration, the ability to um, generate ways in which we can help. There's a, for example, we've, we've demonstrated uh, the way that the fire brigades can, can be much